Today on D-Life, guitarist Leslie West recently discovered just how scary complications from diabetes can be when he was forced to have his leg amputated. The rock legend shares his story. Shepard Ferry is a master of the bold art form known as street art. He's also got some powerful statements to make about diabetes. I'm checking my blood sugar a lot and take my diabetes very seriously. And Jim Turner asks about a day most of us will never forget, the day we got our diagnosis. It was a relief to find out there was a real reason I was sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All of that, plus a beautiful barbecue beef brisket from the D-Life kitchen, and Dr. Nat Strand gets pumped. List the world's greatest rock guitarist, and Leslie West's name is sure to appear. Any idiot can play the song. If you picked up a guitar within a, 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 a day, I can show you how to play the song. From the time he and his band Mountain performed at Woodstock in 1969, through the 1970s when their songs were FM staples, to today where Mississippi Queen and Nantucket Sleigh Ride are played on every classic rock radio station, West has ascended to the rock and roll pantheon. Along the way, he's played with rock royalty from The Who to Ozzy Osbourne and almost everyone else in between. I got to play with Hendrix a little before he died. He says to me, you wanna jam, man? Uh... And we went back to the club and uh, Jimmy played bass. But 30 years ago, West, living the life of a bona fide rock star, was diagnosed with type two diabetes. And his reaction was no surprise. He ignored it. I wasn't listening to anybody. I must felt like George Clooney. I mean, I got the way I was from eating Twinkies and Oreos. I didn't know what they meant, blood sugar. What the hell is that? So I went to the, she says, I think you're diabetic. So what, I have diabetes, what does that mean? There's certain things I had to do. I didn't know what testing, testing. I tested a microphone, that's what, you know. Still he endured, and his career kept evolving. He has his own line of Leslie West guitars, his own iPhone app, and hip hop stars such as Jay-Z and Kanye West have sampled some of his earliest work. So all of a sudden, stuff that I wrote in 69 seems relevant. While touring around the world, he married his current wife, Jenny, in a very public ceremony at the 40th anniversary of Woodstock. You saw The Godfather? You remember when he went over to Italy and got hit by the thunderbolt? <laughs> it's the thunderbolt. He's a very charismatic guy, and I swore I'd never date a musician. I come from a long line of uh, people in the music industry, and he changed my mind. Last June, while heading to, of all places, Mississippi, West, still overweight and a cancer survivor, started experiencing excruciating pain in his right leg. When his leg turned blue, he and his wife knew something was amiss. And the next morning, my foot was turning blue. I mean, it was cadaver blue. And I kept feeling it, and I didn't feel the pulse. So we went to Ocean Springs Hospital. He came up and looked at it, he says, I gotta take you to the emergency room, man. Now he's out, and they said, here's the deal. We are gonna have to cut off his leg, or he, you may, you know, he's probably gonna die. At this point, I think he's gonna hate my guts. You know, I, I have to make this decision. He's completely incoherent. She said, well, wake him up, because I don't want him to wake up and say, I just meant to say, pass the salt, you evil bitch, you cut my leg off. So he said, we can cut it off below the knee, and chances are he'll never make it out of here without doing more surgeries and jeopardizing his life. Obviously, every time he goes under, or we can go above the knee. They didn't tell me exactly where above the knee, so I'm assuming right above the knee. And so I lost my leg, and uh, well, luckily it wasn't one of my arms. Then we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. After surviving the surgery, Wes did what anyone who knows him well would expect. He called his friend Howard Stern. He asked me, where's your leg, man? We can make a lot of money with that leg. I think it's in the Mississippi River or something. He's great about it, but it did me good to talk to him. Right now it's like 
you know, it's short, but who wants to go through that again? Because I see some people that are below the knee, they just snap on that leg and they can walk fast. Mine's a big procedure. You got to put a sleeve on with a bolt. You know, I used to be able to go out, can't just jump in the car. I test my blood now on my fingers 12 times a day. And I only can do it on this hand because I'm going to prick my fingers. I'm not going to do it in the fingers I play with. West is grateful for the support he's getting from friends and fans. They came out with this beagle called the MB1. There's ramps that come out of the middle. And I guess they saw on Facebook. I had to cancel my tour because it wasn't a, a vehicle. The owner of the company, Fred Drasner, used to own the Daily News. Fred just called him up and said, give Leslie one. Even as his 2011 album, Unusual Suspects, went to number four on the Billboard Blues charts, Wes, with the help of his wife, is paying attention to his health and managing his diabetes. Well, well you know what we had last night? He's like a three-year-old. <laughs> what we had last night? Yeah, roast chicken and green bean casserole. No, something. we had Brussels sprouts. Oh, Brussels sprouts. Yeah. Okay. Anything you want Southern, I can make a healthy version of it. I eat vegetables now. My wife, uh, she wants to keep me around, I guess. And Wes says he has a simple answer to anyone who wants his opinion on dealing with diabetes. Go, go to your doctor and listen to what he says. That's what I'd say. Test and test your blood sugar. That's what I would say. Because if you don't test, how are you going to know? When we come back, street artist Shepard Ferry. Shepard Ferry is an artist of the street. The urban world is his canvas. His work is designed to have impact. But revolutionary as his art may be, his personal life requires some compromise. Shepard has type 1 diabetes. I am very busy. I travel a lot. I work long hours. It isn't always the easiest thing to manage my diabetes, but my art and the things I want to accomplish are extremely important to me. So I just try to go out of my way to make sure that I'm checking my blood sugar a lot, that I have access to the, the food I need and take my diabetes very seriously. Hey, might be a little low. Shepard is red hot. His work hit the American mainstream when he created the iconic hope image of Barack Obama during the 2008 presidential campaign. Do we have another top? That's a long leap from his first street art campaign, which championed a different kind of icon altogether. The Obey Giant campaign really started as a joke, a sticker that I made of Andre the Giant, the wrestler, for some friends, but quickly I realized that images shared in public space that don't have an obvious agenda make people question that image and then question it in the context of all the other stuff they're confronted with. So I started to think about encouraging people to really analyze the control of public space and the control of the dissemination of images and ideas. But sometimes that public dissemination puts him at odds with the law. As a street artist, I'm taking the risk of being arrested because putting artwork up in public space is sometimes illegal. And I have been arrested. And several times after I was arrested, if I had my insulin in my pocket, when I'm brought in, they take all your possessions. And I actually have gotten very sick from being in jail a day or two without insulin. One time um, in New York, I actually thought that I might perish in jail. It was a very scary situation. Fortunately, his cellmates screamed for the guards, and he was rushed to the hospital in time. But if it happens again, he'll be better prepared. I ended up getting uh, a tattoo that says diabetic because no one would get a tattoo that says diabetic just because it's cool. <laughs> what is cool, he says, is the ability to use his passion for a good cause that's close to his heart. 
Finding a Cure for Diabetes. The cure piece that I did for JDRF was just to get people to think about children living with diabetes. It's so important to think about the, the health of all people, but I think children especially inspire compassion. Ferry is married and has two daughters under the age of six. Neither has diabetes, but he's watchful for the symptoms he remembers from his own childhood. I just turned 16 when I was diagnosed with diabetes. And at that time, I was very healthy. I skateboarded every day, did a lot of exercise, and had a lot of energy. And all of a sudden, I started having to go to the bathroom a lot, urinate a lot, and I was tired. I didn't even mention it to my dad, who's a doctor, until my vision started to get blurry. My dad kept saying, if you keep running high blood sugars, you're gonna regret it later. I said, ah, you know, I feel great, you know, whatever. And, um, and he was right. In his early 30s, Shepherd's world nearly came unhinged. When I first had a bleed in my eye 10 years ago, that was a wake up call for me because as an artist, I need great eyesight and it's, it's essential to what I do. I ended up having to have two surgeries, one in each eye, and a lot of people don't end up recovering their eyesight as well as I have, so I'm very lucky. But the complications from diabetes that you can get to your vascular system in general are very, very serious, but your eyes are particularly sensitive. Following the surgeries, Shepard got serious about his diabetes and jumped on some new technical innovations. The pump is incredible. I wish I had gotten it sooner. But the other thing that made a really big difference was checking my blood sugar 10, 12 times a day instead of twice a day. Shepard also keeps connected to the pulse of the community through music, often DJing under the name DJ Diabetic and MC Insulin. I love music. And in the same way that art can be a striking visual but have a provocative message, I think music can have a, a great melody and deliver provocative lyrics. I think art is really undervalued as a tool to get people's attention and inspire them to look further in depth into an issue or an idea. It's hard to quantify how much of a difference something makes, but to me, if it makes any difference at all, it's worth doing. Coming up next, it's barbecue beef brisket with Chef Michelle. Hi, I'm Chef Michelle Nishan, and welcome to the D-Life Kitchen. Now today we're going to make a delicious homestyle barbecue beef brisket with a southwestern flair. Now what I love about this dish is that it's really tasty, full of nutrients, and really great to serve if you have a large group or it's a holiday because you can get up to 12 servings from this one five pound brisket. Now another thing that I love about brisket or beef in general is that it's a natural source of vitamin B12, which is an essential vitamin that's really difficult to get from anything other than red meat. So good stuff. What I love to do is um, just kind of trim off any excess fat because we're going to use the marinade as a sauce and if you get a lot of fat in the marinade when you're cooking it, you have to skim it off at the end. So let's just start by trimming it, which is what I do here. Now, for the marinade, what I like to do is use some local honey, and I love working with local honey because it's a non-processed sweetener. It's not a refined sugar, and it also adds just a little bit of extra flavor. I really love it. Now, here we have a little bit of vinegar, and any vinegar, you know, malt vinegar, cider vinegar, would be delicious, and some light soy sauce. Um, when you get a little bit of that good soy protein, but you also get that kind of fermented flavor that as it marinates and cooks, makes for a great sauce. Here we have a little bit of already sliced roasted garlic, about three tablespoons. Love garlic. And here we have chipotle peppers, and I love using chipotle peppers. They're smoked jalapenos, very high in vitamin C. And then we have some nice diced tomatoes. Now you can use fresh tomatoes in season or canned tomatoes out of season. Tomatoes are really high in lycopene, which has been thought to help prevent heart disease and certain types of cancer. And you actually get more lycopene in cooked or canned tomatoes than you do in raw. But these are going to cook, so this is perfectly fine. Combine the ingredients for the marinade, just like this. And then we're going to 
pour it over the brisket. And you can let this marinate anywhere from six hours to overnight. So now we're gonna place this in a preheated 300 degree oven and let it cook for about five to six hours or just until that brisket starts to beautifully fall apart. It's been about five and a half hours. And wow, look at that. That is beautiful brisket. And as you can see, the uh, marinade's really kind of simmered down a little bit, dehydrated, and just left you with this really kind of really great glaze. And this is how you know your brisket is done. You can just flake a piece off. You can really treat this almost like pulled pork on a sandwich, on a salad, with some really great vegetable sides. This is amazing stuff. What I like to do is just put it on, on the table in the pan that you cooked it in and just sprinkle it with a little bit of fresh cilantro. And I love fresh chopped cilantro because it kind of brings that whole southwestern flavor home. Now, if you're not a cilantro fan, that's fine because you can use freshly chopped parsley, chives, whatever your favorite herb is. But look at this. This is a beautiful, low carb, super nutritious meal that's really easy to make, makes your house smell fabulous. Now for this recipe and other great tips on managing your diabetes or your health in general, visit the website at dlife.com slash recipe box. I'm Michelle Nishan and thanks for joining us in the DLife Kitchen. I'm Dr. Nat Strand, DLife patient champion. My insulin pump is smaller than my phone and barely noticeable to most people. But did you know that the very first insulin pump was the size of a hiking backpack? Developed in 1963 by Dr. Arnold Kadish, the device monitored blood sugar levels and administered insulin in response, a predecessor to today's cutting edge artificial pancreas work. In 1978, the first wearable infusion pump, the auto syringe, hit the scene. Invented by Dean Kamen, the same man who invented the personal transportation device, the Segway, the auto syringe was the first device to allow patients continuous insulin infusion on the go. Although much smaller than the backpack, it was known by the nickname the Big Blue Brick due to its bulky size. In the 1980s and 90s, companies like Medtronic Minimed made great strides in reducing the size of portable insulin pumps while increasing features and flexibility. Since then, advances in pump technology have led to many new innovations, including patch pumps, insulin pods that are controlled wirelessly, and pumps that are integrated with continuous glucose monitoring systems. To learn more about insulin pumps, visit dlife.com pump. When we come back, Jim Turner talks about Diagnosis Day. 1959, now you know how old I am. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> When you're diagnosed with diabetes, that's a period in someone's life that people tend to remember. And whether you were confused, scared, anxious, relieved, your diagnosis of diabetes is one that stays with you the rest of your life. We went to a Taking Control of Your Diabetes conference in Sacramento, and we talked to people about this very critical moment in time. When were you diagnosed with diabetes? At the age of 10 in 1959, now you know how old I am. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> I was just diagnosed about two and a half weeks ago. Welcome to the club. Yes. In March 1963. Wow. 62. Oh, 62. Even longer. <laughs> I was 15, and maybe like yourself, thirsty, urinating, losing tons of weight. My mom brought me into the doctor for a, what she thought was a bladder infection, and it turned out to be diabetes. How long have you had diabetes? 42 years. Yeah, me too. You're twins. We yes. are twins. And who was diagnosed first? I was diagnosed when we were 10, and then uh, I was diagnosed uh, two years ago at 19. That's funny. It's uh, such a... Hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> and fun. And fun, yeah. And what happened emotionally to you when you were told you had this? I just wanted to be the same as the rest of my friends. When I was little, it really didn't affect me that much because it was just like something I had to do. I was disappointed in myself because I knew I could have prevented it. It took me a while to 
not be so angry. I think I accepted it right away. I was relieved because I, I had been going through all these symptoms for weeks mm -hmm. of being tired and just having no energy. It gave me a wake-up call, mm -hmm. like I need to change. Coming from a Christian science background, it was very difficult for my family to accept. And finally, uh, the old man stepped in and said, uh, we don't have a choice. You've got to go to the doctor and you have to take the medication. It was a relief to find out I, there was a real reason yeah. I was sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. That, that's what happened to me. I, oh, was, really? I was relieved. Yeah. I was like, oh, I can deal with this because I need to get better. What would you tell somebody if somebody came to you and said, I was just diagnosed with diabetes? They have the ability to do anything that they want to set their mind to, and diabetes isn't going to stand in the way of their life. Keep active physically and mentally. Anger and being upset, those are normal emotions. Follow the, what the doctor says and, and watch what you eat and exercise. Get the education. Mm -hmm. Education from your physicians, conferences. Check your blood sugar before you eat. You can have good food. You don't necessarily have to have many carbs involved. Being diabetic forces you to live how you should. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like I said, it's not the end of the world. It's just, you know, look on the bright side. You know, you still really have your health. You just have to work to keep it. Yeah. It's going to take time. It's not going to be easy, but it's life. And yeah. that's, you know, it is what it is. And you just roll with the punches. We'll be right back with more D-Life. That does it for this edition of D-Life. Thanks for stopping by. But you can visit us anytime, day or night, at dlife.com or on our mobile app. Try a new recipe, ask a diabetes question, and meet other D-Life members just like you. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter for all the latest D-Life news. Remember, tomorrow is a new diabetes day. See you next week.